In recent years, a series of extraordinary finds has been made in the Holy Land. These astonishing discoveries are linked to some of the most famous events in the Bible. Do they provide new evidence about the burial of Jesus? And about the legendary Temple of Solomon? This is something that biblical scholars have been waiting for, have been dreaming of for many years. Here is a proof. We can touch it, we can, we can smell it, we can go see it. This is where we came from. It's an earthquake, a revolution. Or is there another darker story behind these mysterious objects? Jerusalem, the Holy Land's most important city. For centuries, it's been the center of a flourishing antiquity trade. Government inspectors try to monitor the trade, but thousands of artifacts change hands here every day. Genuine pieces 2,000 or more years old can be bought for a few hundred dollars. Many collectors have learned not to ask awkward questions about how the dealer came by them. It was here more than 25 years ago in Jerusalem's antiquity market that one of the most remarkable artifacts in the Holy Land's history first came to light. It was a tiny object, just four centimeters long, badly damaged. No one knew where it came from, but it would be hailed as a unique piece of history. It became known as the ivory pomegranate. It was thought to be the ornamental tip of a priest's ceremonial staff. But what most amazed the experts was the inscription. Kodesh Kohanim Lebeit Adonai. Holy to the priests of the house of God. It suggested that this exquisite little ornament was used by priests in the first temple of Jerusalem. This temple, according to the Bible, was built by King Solomon. If the pomegranate was what its inscription claimed, it was a revolutionary find. Before it came to light, there was no independent evidence apart from the Bible that King Solomon's temple had actually existed. 3,000 years ago, Jerusalem was a small Iron Age city whose ambitious king, the Bible tells us, decided to build a house for his God. The Bible states, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, the construction of the Temple of the Lord was begun. The existence of Solomon's temple is central to traditional Jewish belief. The house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was threescore cubits, the breadth thereof 20 cubits, and the height thereof 30 cubits. Over 40 feet high and nearly 100 feet long, the house of God would have dominated the city and its people. Since then, Jerusalem has suffered nearly 2,500 years of turbulent history. Jews, Christians, and Muslims all claim a stake in the city that features so large in the history of their faiths. A vast Muslim shrine, the Dome of the Rock, now occupies the site where Solomon's temple is presumed to have stood. According to biblical history, the temple was destroyed by fire in 586 BCE by invaders from Babylon. The western wall where Jewish pilgrims now come to pray is all that's left of a second temple built on the same site as Solomon's temple by Herod the Great 500 years later. In a country where cultural and territorial rights are the essence of politics, the story of Solomon's temple has special significance for the Jews. But there's no trace of the temple itself, and archaeologists are not allowed to dig in such a politically sensitive area. Archaeologist Israel Finkelstein has amassed thousands of artifacts from other sites from that period of history but not a fragment of evidence to back up the Bible's account of Solomon's temple. 
There's no archaeological evidence for the simple reason that we cannot excavate in a temple mount. Uh, I think also that uh, even if it uh, was possible to do something on a temple mount, there's a big question whether we could have uh, discovered anything from the first temple of the of biblical times, because there was a huge building operation there in the time of Herod the Great, and there's good reason to think that everything was eradicated. The pomegranate was an extraordinary find. The tiny artifact with a large chip on one side would be the first physical link to the lost temple of Solomon. But was the pomegranate authentic? Most of the loot is brought to the Jerusalem market where the ivory pomegranate first appeared. The man who came across it here happened to be one of the world's leading experts on ancient inscriptions, Professor André Lemaire. One of the sellers told me, I know uh, uh, an inscription uh, which uh, belongs to somebody else, and uh, will you be interested to see it? He examined it closely. It is a very small object. Uh, you have to be aware that it is only about four centimeters high. And uh, the inscription is still smaller, of course. And uh, uh, looking uh, at it uh, very carefully, I found that, from what I could say, uh, everything was okay. Uh, there was uh, no problem. After inspecting the engraved Aramaic text, Le Maire had no doubt it was genuine. He published his report, declaring it to be an authentic relic from the 8th century BCE, around the time of Solomon's temple. The tiny pomegranate would have played a humble part in the magnificent temple. It would have been carried on processions through the two great halls, whose walls were paneled with sweet-smelling cedar wood. If the pomegranate belonged to one of the high priests, it would have accompanied him into the temple's inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, where winged cherubim guarded the Ark of the Covenant and the towering walls were encrusted with gold. But however humble its role might have been then, it was now the only artifact to survive from the temple. The Israel Museum, home to a world-renowned collection of biblical artifacts, was now very keen to acquire it. It was an object of some excitement because when first identified, it was considered that it might be an object directly connected to the first temple, to Solomon's temple. And we really have very little material that comes from that period from Jerusalem and that can be directly connected to that moment in history of the ancient land of Israel. But when the museum tried to track down the owner, it ran into a wall. The pomegranate had already changed hands. There wasn't a dealer in Israel who could locate it. The word was it had been smuggled out of the country. Then, several years later, in 1987, the museum received a mysterious phone call. Shalom. Hello? Ken. I can tell you about the price of Rimon Ashenav. Who is Berlin? The pomegranate was now available, but at a price. Who wants a million dollars? Desperate to get its hands on this unique piece of Jewish heritage, the museum bartered the price down to just over half a million dollars in cash. Israel's leading expert was asked to check it out. When he too decided it was genuine, the cash provided by an anonymous donor was paid into an anonymous Swiss bank account. The pomegranate was returned to Jerusalem. There in the Israel Museum, along with such priceless national treasures as the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was given pride of place, an authentic link to King Solomon's temple. For nearly 20 years, it was regarded as the only physical evidence for the temple.
then, in uncannily similar circumstances, another extraordinary relic suddenly appeared, sparking another artifact mystery. In 2002, the chief investigator for the Israel Antiquities Authority, Amir Ganor, was given a special mission, track down a brand new piece of biblical history that had gone missing. It was a hunt that would take him all across Israel and provide a major scoop for a young Israeli newspaper reporter. The story begins in 2001. A professor from the Jerusalem University um, receives a call from a mysterious person um, who uh, refuses to give his real name and asks this professor to come to a hotel in Jerusalem. He arrives at another professor. Um, he receives another call saying, uh, we are changing the location of the meeting. Please pay, take a taxi to a different hotel. A person who he has never met before arrives with a briefcase. The man with the briefcase claimed to be acting on behalf of a client. He couldn't reveal his client's identity, but he was sure the professors would be very interested by what he had brought to show them. He opens up the briefcase, takes out a gorgeous piece of black stone with an ancient writing on it, and asks the two professors to authenticate the piece. The inscription on the shiny black stone described repairs made to the Temple of Solomon by a king called Jehoash in the 8th century BCE. If it was genuine, it was priceless. Like the ivory pomegranate, it appeared to confirm that Solomon's temple had actually existed. Better still, it provided unique confirmation of events described in the Old Testament. The professors wanted to know who the owner was and where the object had come from. All the stranger would reveal was that it had been found near the Temple Mount. They wanted to take the stone, they wanted to, to you know, perform a thorough investigation of, uh, of, this, of it and to authenticate it or reveal it as a forgery. Uh, the, the person refused, of course, to give the stone, he said that's impossible. Uh, because of, you know, complications. There was no way the professors could properly authenticate the tablet after such a brief examination. You know, he takes the stone, he puts it as bad as back in his briefcase. He says, thank you very much to the two bewildered professors um, and leaves them behind in the Jerusalem lobby. The tablet had allegedly been found at the foot of the Temple Mount the heart of Old Jerusalem. It's here, according to legend, that Solomon's temple once stood. But how could anyone be sure that a blackened stone, allegedly found in a pile of rubble, was a genuine 3,000-year-old relic? The owner, whoever he was, realized this. Shortly afterwards, other experts were secretly approached by intermediaries and asked if they could authenticate the tablet. One of them, geologist Amnon Rosenfeld, has spent his working life studying the rocks around Jerusalem, used by masons and engravers in biblical times. We were asked to examine something that should be kept secret called the Joash tablet. Our starting point was that this is a, a fake and we should find some uh, signature of a forgery. Dr. Rosenfeld and his colleagues were allowed to examine the stone over several months in his lab at the Geological Survey of Israel. We couldn't find anything that led us to the conclusion that it's a, a forgery. We find many criteria that point out that uh, it might be an authentic inscription. If the tablet was genuine, it was precisely what Jewish archaeologists had been seeking for ages. I was very excited because this type of inscription is something that biblical scholars have been waiting for, have been hoping for, have been dreaming of. For, for, many, for many years. 
the inscription on the tablet corroborated the Bible's account of how King Jehoash decided to refurbish the temple. It says repairs were needed to the stone and woodwork, which by then would have been over 100 years old. They in turn shall strengthen the damage in the house, wherever damage may be found. This is how the tablet records those events. I repaired the construction and I made the repairs in the temple and the walls all around and the side buildings and the lattice work and the trap doors and the recesses and the doors. And I think that we're speaking about the same royal act of repairs in the temple. And um, the language is also rather similar. Meanwhile, the analysis of the tablet revealed more. They found the surface contained tiny flecks of over 2,000-year-old charcoal. They also found tiny specks of gold, just what might be expected if it had survived a fire when the gold-encrusted Temple of Solomon was destroyed. The astonishing revelation was widely regarded as proof that the tablet was genuine. Everyone was, was dumbfounded by this, this discovery. I mean, it, it was like a, a, you know, an a alien spacecraft landing in, in the middle of Jerusalem. Uh, here's a stone with an inscription that is actually quoted from the Jewish Bible. And that proves that a Jewish temple actually stood in Jerusalem. Here is a proof that um, our national heritage is, can be basically, you know, we can touch it, we can, we can smell it, we can go see it, we can take our children. This is where we came from. The Israel Antiquities Authority urgently wanted to know how the owner, whoever he was, had come by such an artifact of national and historical importance. Amir Ganor, the authority's chief investigator, grilled his contacts in the market for information. He suspected it had been illegally looted. But the word on the street told a different story. I traveled to Jerusalem and started to dig uh, and try and find out who the um, owner of this new tablet is. And um, the uh, people in the antique industry uh, who, who you know, do not like to expose their, their identity, um, uh, was, they told me straight away that they think it's a hoax. Whether it was a hoax or loot or the genuine article, Amir Ganor was determined to track down the owner and the tablet itself, which had now disappeared again. We spent three months on the road to try to find this uh, tablet. The months of detective work finally led him to Tel Aviv, Israel's modern commercial capital. And to the home of a businessman, one of Israel's leading antiquity collectors, Oded Golan. Golan has been collecting ancient artifacts since he was a boy. Uh, here, you are looking now at the oldest, the most ancient dictionary ever found in the world. I found it when I was 10 years old. He admitted he'd been helping to sell the missing stone tablet, but denied that he'd ever been its owner. He was a dealer, Palestinian dealer, who had a shop in East Jerusalem. Abu Yasser was his nickname. I didn't have enough money to buy it. And he asked me if I can help him to sell it or to offer it to somebody, and I had actually only one condition. It should stay in a museum uh, for the public. But how much was he asking for it? Uh, several hundred thousands of dollars. But the authorities were not convinced by the story. What made them highly suspicious was that the same collector, Oded Golan, had recently been involved in another sensational discovery. This one, a relic with incredible possibilities. In the vast collection of ancient treasures held by the Israel Antiquities Authority, 
there are hundreds of stone boxes, all dating back to the time of Jesus. Simply engraved, some bearing a name in Hebrew or Greek, they had a macabre purpose. They are ossuaries, receptacles for storing the bones of the dead. In 2002, one of these ancient bone boxes became the center of worldwide media attention. Yaakov bar Yosef, a key de Yeshua. The inscription translates as James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. For these familiar names from the New Testament to appear together seemed a remarkable coincidence. The ancient bone box was hailed as the final resting place of St. James, the brother of Jesus of Nazareth, and the first archaeological evidence linked to Jesus himself. It caused a sensation and was viewed by nearly 100,000 people at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Another extraordinary biblical artifact. And its owner was the same collector, Oded Golan. Two dramatic artifacts were discovered in the space of six months by the same um, collector. This was very, very difficult to believe. I mean, you know, what's, what's next? The, the, the shoes of, of, uh, of Muhammad? I have to admit that it sounds uh, quite strange. But if you have the good contacts, the good relationship, you get the good stuff. It's very simple. He claimed he had owned the ossuary for years. In the mid-70s, I bought several ossuaries, actually three, and I bought it in East Jerusalem. So why had it taken him 30 years to realize the potential significance of the inscription? The first person who actually uh, gave me the idea that it could belong to the family of Jesus Christ was uh, Professor André Lamer. Back in the 1980s, Lemaire had been responsible for authenticating the ivory pomegranate. 20 years later, his reputation as an expert in ancient inscriptions proved valuable to Oded Golan. I was amazed with the name, and mainly with the appellation uh, uh, Brother of Yeshua, uh, James, uh, the brother of Jesus. For me, there is no problem about the fact that uh, the inscription is genuine. Professor Lemaire's opinion that the inscription was genuine transformed the Brother of Jesus ossuary into an archaeological sensation. But not every expert was convinced that the inscription was authentic. I laughed. I couldn't believe it. You've got to be kidding. It's not the same script. It's not even a complete script design. To Dr. Rochelle Altman, it seemed that the inscription had been cobbled together from bits of genuine inscriptions. She thought that the first part of the inscription, James, son of Joseph, was probably authentic, but that the brother of Jesus had been added later by another hand. Yaakov bar Yosef is original. This is the ossuary of this man. And all of a sudden, here's this, and this is a totally different script. It's made out of different pieces and pastes together. And that's exactly what we have here. This is an obviously a fake. With allegations of forgery flying around, the authorities decided to crack down. Police and antiquities authority agents raided Oded Golan's home. They found an incriminating photograph of the collector clutching the missing Jehoash tablet, the relic he'd always denied owning. They made him hand over both the tablet and the ossuary box. The artifacts and their collector were about to be subjected to intense scrutiny. The Israel Antiquities Authority set up a task force to decide on the authenticity of both objects. In charge of the scientific investigation was Professor Yuval Goran of Tel Aviv University. He began with the stone tablet. He wanted to establish whether it could have come from the site of Solomon's Temple on the Temple Mount. The stone surface should provide valuable clues. 
Over time, all objects develop a patina, a thin crust bonded to their surfaces. It's created by chemical reactions between the object and its environment. But when Gorin examined the patina, he found that it was different on the front and the back of the stone. The patina on the front did indeed appear to come from Jerusalem. But instead of being bonded to the stone, it lifted off quite easily. The patina is very loosely uh, connected to the stone. Here you can see how it reacts to uh, uh, me scraping it with uh, a matchstick. And you can see that it easily peels off the letters as opposed again to the uh, patina on the back side. The patina on the back was quite different and appeared not to come from Jerusalem at all. He concluded that someone had taken an old stone from somewhere else and carved an inscription on the front, which had then been concealed under new artificial patina. He could even see evidence that the carving was recent. When uh, the letters are cleared, um, the inner part of the letters is exposed and uh, as you can see here, it is uh, very freshly cut. You can see even the little lines, the little parallel lines of uh, either the chisel or even uh, maybe some uh, drill, some electric bit or drill with which the letters were engraved, which is of course very unusual for ancient uh, inscriptions. But what of the ancient charcoal and traces of gold which had convinced earlier scientists? Gorin concluded they had simply been added to the artificial patina applied to the front of the stone. And therefore, I believe that the inscription is uh, not genuine. He then focused on the brother of Jesus ossuary. The bone box itself appeared to be genuine. The stone was covered by a chalky patina just what he'd expect if it had spent many years in an underground tomb. But the patina in the grooves of the inscription was different. Like the Jehoash tablet, it was not firmly bonded to the surface. It looked as if the engraver had cut through the original patina, then filled in the grooves with a new material to make it look ancient. On June 18, 2003, the Israel Antiquities Authority went public. Both objects were declared fake. Certainly that the patina in the letters in both items is a modern forgery covering the letters. It makes headlines worldwide. Experts who authenticated the artifacts have their names dragged through the mud. But more damning evidence comes to light when police and authority inspectors raid Oded Golan's premises again. They find engraving tools, chemicals, and soil samples taken from sites all over Israel. Together with scores of artifacts, many look freshly minted or half finished. They confiscated several tools that I had in my home. These kind of tools uh, are existed in the hands of any collector and any dealer in Israel. The evidence leads to Golan being charged on 15 counts of forgery and fraud. Four other dealers are accused of being accomplices. I never forged anything in my life. Of course, I shall have to defend myself, but they have nothing to do with forgeries at all. No matter who was responsible, it seemed a sophisticated fraud was beginning to unravel. And as the investigation continued, one of Israel's most sacred relics would fall under suspicion. Three years later, the prosecution of Oded Golan on fraud and forgery charges continues, with no end in sight. The scandal has provoked anxiety about every artifact supposedly from biblical times that has come from dealers or sources unknown. Could they all be forgeries? Yuval Goren has checked scores of items that museums and collectors have acquired on the market. He's concluded that almost all of them are fake. 
Some archaeologists believe there's only one answer to this problem. The antiquity trade should be shut down and its products should be shunned. Objects must come from an archaeological excavation done by archaeologists. Then they are genuine, there's no question about them. Then they are okay, they can use them for historical research. Even whatever comes from the market is forgery until otherwise proven. Whether an artifact is genuine, looted, or fake, there are ways of enhancing its market value. As investigators uncover more fakes, they detect a pattern emerging of ancient objects being embellished with inscriptions to enhance their value and historical significance. Inevitably, attention returned to that priceless object in the Israel Museum, the ivory pomegranate. The pomegranate was now the only item believed to have survived from Solomon's legendary temple. Over 25 years have passed since the pomegranate was first authenticated by one of the world's experts on ancient inscriptions, Professor André Lemaire. Since then, experts discovered that it wasn't actually made of elephant ivory. It is a little pomegranate uh, made of a tooth of a hippopotamus. The big question was, did the pomegranate really come from Solomon's temple? When Professor Goren examined the surface of the pomegranate, he saw little to suggest that it wasn't a genuine artifact. You can see that it is, uh, it is old, uh, it is worn. There were signs of a few repairs, traces of what looked like glue, but the patina looked authentic. He then turned his attention to the inscription. Kodesh Kohanim Lebeit Adonai, which means holy to the priests of the house of God. And this is why this pomegranate was considered to be from the uh, Solomonic Temple. But the pomegranate was badly damaged sometime during its history. You can see the, the uh, break that took off about a third of the body of the pomegranate. Most of the inscription is intact, but a large chunk is missing. He noticed that the grooves cut by the engraver appeared to stop short of the break. This was odd. He would have expected them to be sliced cleanly when the pomegranate was damaged. The lines are ending before the edge of the break, which means that whoever engraved it was very careful not to uh, make other breaks into the old break. It looked to Goren as if the inscription had been engraved after the pomegranate had been damaged. It is clear when you look at it through the microscope that the inscription was engraved in it, on it when it was already broken. His conclusion, the inscription must have been added to boost the pomegranate's value. It is probably a fake. It's probably a forgery. The pomegranate has been declared a fake and removed from display in the Israel Museum. There is no rest in the world of religious relics and their authenticity. Another furious argument exploded about another discovery. Jerusalem can prove a nightmare for archaeological research, with major monuments of three religions crowding on top of each other. In a quiet residential quarter called Talpiot, apartment blocks overlook one of the most contentious archaeological sites in the world. In a tiny rose garden, a large concrete slab conceals the entrance to a 2,000-year-old tomb. The crudely built structure offers no clues to the potential importance of what lies beneath. Cut into the rocky hillside, the tomb was discovered accidentally in 1980, when the whole area was still a construction site. Before it could disappear under the new buildings, a small team of archaeologists was allowed to examine the tomb and its contents. Among them was Shimon Gibson, then 21 years old. His job was to map the inside of the tomb. Well, under this cement slab is a shaft which descends uh, for uh, a couple of uh, meters down into the ground. 
At the bottom of this shaft is an opening, which is uh, situated here, which leads into a burial chamber, which is still intact. It's, it's really nice. After 27 years, the tomb is still here. The tomb itself was full of soil, at least up to knee level at the time of the excavation, which meant that the door had been opened in antiquity and that soil had flowed in to uh, the cave itself. So this wasn't an intact tomb. Questions about when it was broken into ignited speculation about what the tomb originally contained. Ossuaries removed from the tomb have been kept at the Antiquities Authority's storehouse since they were discovered. It was there 27 years later in 2007 that the names inscribed on the ossuaries provoked intense media speculation about the occupants of the tomb. Most of the names are well known from the New Testament of the Bible. Meriame, a form of Mary, Mary Magdalene perhaps. Yose, a short form of Joseph. Maria, another Mary. And then, most astonishing of all, Yeshua bar Yosef, Jesus, son of Joseph. Could this be the resting place of Jesus himself? The suggestion that this might be the tomb of the family of Jesus received worldwide publicity. Now, the man involved in the original excavation wants to examine the tomb again. Anything which is sealed up creates a kind of sort of atmosphere of conspiracy. So I think opening up the slab and allowing cameras to go down and to have a look at the tomb will be uh, a good thing. Permission has been given to examine the tomb, but it soon becomes clear that some residents don't want an excavation in their backyard. An area which is, and there's a lot of uh, emotion. This highlights the problems that can arise for archaeologists in a country where religious passions run high. Call a police that he doesn't want uh, uh, us excavating. Um, and he's uh, quite angry. Continuing could provoke a worse disturbance, so the Talpiot tomb remains sealed. But by relying on the map Gibson drew of the tomb when it was opened, we can still get a good idea of how the remains of the family were laid out. There were bones and skulls lying on the floor. The ossuaries lay in small chambers cut into the walls of the tomb. The box bearing the name Jesus, son of Joseph, was one of the smallest, tucked in the back of a chamber. Most archaeologists are very skeptical that this could really have been Jesus of Nazareth. One thing I can tell you for certain, and that is that there were no uh, remains of a crucified man in this tomb. The coincidence of the names, however striking, fails to impress specialists in this period of history. These names are extremely common among the local Jewish population in the time of Jesus. It's also problematic because everything that we know about Jesus and his family indicates that they were a relatively poor family who could not have afforded a rock-cut tomb. If they had owned a rock-cut tomb, presumably it would have been in Nazareth, their hometown, not in Jerusalem. We have good evidence for this from other wealthy families around the country. While the historical controversy rages, some scientists suggest re-examining the ossuaries that came from the disturbed tomb. American researchers now subject them to forensic-style scrutiny, especially the most controversial Jesus, son of Joseph box and inscription. Could the dirt that's impacted in the inscription be concealing signs of recent tampering? I want to suggest something different. We're actually trying to remove some of the uh, soil that's been impacted in the inscriptions and scratches. Not only that, uh, try to remove the soil safely, is not to destroy any patina. Yeah, so the grooves of the inscription contain traces of mud, which have to be removed if they are to examine the inscription in detail. It seems that Jesus, son of Joseph, may not be the only name engraved on the box. It appears that the name Yeshua, if this is the actual name, because it's a very difficult name to read, is not the original name on this ossuary. 
Yeshua appears to be superinscribed over an earlier name that appeared before that. It could be something like Yudan, Hanun, or a number of possibilities, but Yeshua was not the first one in the ossuary. The name Yeshua bar Yosef, Jesus son of Joseph, has been inscribed very crudely and incorporates some of the underlying inscription. Could this have an innocent explanation? Or has the name Jesus been carved later as a deliberate deception by adding a few extra strokes, then using mud to make them look older? Yeah, he's coming, he's coming away there. Maybe you're right about the, the mud here that was put as a disguise, you know, to yes. cover up things, mm -hmm. yeah? The existence of this hardened mud inside, we have to look for some explanation for it because we don't really have a good explanation yet. But that's what we're in the process of doing, is trying to figure out if this hardened mud was something that somebody pressed into the inscription in order to make it look better or, or whatever. It's not, not very clear yet. So now you're starting to get some of the patina away. If we're able to remove the mud successfully without damaging the inscription itself, this would hope to at least dispel any ideas that this has any problems in terms of uh, some kind of tampering. But these questions are not likely to be answered just yet. Worried that removing the mud might risk harming the ossuary's delicate patina, the Israel Antiquities Authority has now called a halt to further investigation. Whatever the eventual conclusions about tampering, the scientists' concerns are symptomatic of the widespread anxiety and alarm caused by recent revelations of fakery and fraud. I do think that the recent sensational claims um, have made a mockery of the discipline of archaeology. When a real and important archaeological find is made, the public are unable to evaluate whether it's true or false. In a country where three powerful religions stake their claims to be the heirs of history, where believers will seize on any evidence that backs up their faith, archaeologists have a tough job separating fact from fiction. This matters a lot to us if we ever want to live in a real world, because what we have is fiction invading the real world. It stains uh, archaeological research, first of all. It stains the you know, reconstruction of uh, biblical history. And there is a, whole, a complete contamination of, of, of our research. And I think that we need to make a statement against this. By producing relics of Solomon's temple, Jesus, and other biblical stories, forgers can make a lot of money. But it's not just museums and wealthy collectors who are being defrauded. Here, distorting history has profound consequences for everyone. You know, you feel betrayed. You feel that you were uh, deceived. It's, it's one thing to lie about something that is not important to people. And it's, it's some, something that's to lie about something that is um, intrinsic to their identity.